Uh, yesterday, uh, you all heard uh, Kariti refer to the evaluator or the compartment abstraction several times in the Realm talk as where a lot of the um, things that used to be on the Realm side have moved uh, in, in decoupling uh, the, the uh, Realms and CES and the compartments. So today I'm going to be talking about that compartment abstraction. I'm going to be talking about it in the context of CES. CES serves many constituencies that use JavaScript in very different ways. Uh, XS is uh, the JavaScript for use in embedded done by Modable. Uh, TC53 is the ECMA committee for standardizing JavaScript modules for use in embedded. Uh, and their target is CES, it's in, uh, modules for use on a CES machine. Um, Salesforce and MetaMask both use CES uh, in the browser. Uh, Node uh, is adopting elements of CES uh, and elements that support CES uh, into Node. Uh, and that's, of course, for use of CES on the server. And then Agoric uh, is using CES both on the blockchain using the XS engine uh, and on solo machines using Node. So what we've done is as we've gone through and iterated through these various different ways to use JavaScript and what the nature of their need for CES is, um, we've used that to arrive at uh, a compartment API that we really quite love. In fact, this compartment API is mostly derived from what Modable has already implemented. Um, and what Modable uh, initially designed uh, with um, uh, Patrick Soke at, at Modable uh, and with many refinements by uh, J.F. Paradis of uh, Agoric. Um, uh, and what we have found really clarifying is the view of these needs from TC53, because embedded is such a different way of using JavaScript than the way we normally think to use JavaScript. So looking at that, in combination with the other perspectives that we're more used to is very, very illuminating, and we'll, we'll see how. Quick historic recap. Um, JavaScript started off as a really, really messy language that was very, very hard to use in a defensible or um, or disciplined manner. Um, it had uh, tremendous misfeatures. Uh, and as we proceeded forward, the what we started with was not so much trying to add new features to make things better, but adding the ability to do an enforced removal uh, of misfeatures. So we introduced uh, ECMAScript strict mode that uh, for uh, code that was in strict mode, uh, did not have access to some of the worst misfeatures. It was limited to a much more disciplined language that you could reason about. So this is our general approach, is don't add security, remove insecurity. Um, and you, you can think of this the same way for uh, defensive programming or disciplined programming, et cetera. But ECMAScript strict still has uh, misfeatures that make good defensive, disciplined, or secure programming uh, impossible, which led to the, um, was the motivation for CES, uh, where the main differences are that uh, whereas in strict mode, you still have a completely mutable set of primordials where anybody, uh, any code linked into that realm can completely corrupt the entire realm by destroying the primordials, uh, and where all code in the realm has access to the same global object. Uh, so with both of those, uh, there is this um, uh, total mutual vulnerability uh, of every module uh, inside a program to every other module. Uh, so in CES, uh, the main differences are that the primordials are transitively frozen and made harmless, uh, and that we create uh, separate global objects per compartment, giving us uh, a, a featherweight uh, isolation boundary within a realm. But despite these small number of things that were turned off, uh, the really important thing about the CES design is that 
uh, the vast majority of JavaScript uh, is still present and is unchanged in its semantics. Uh, and the result is that a tremendous amount of old code runs unmodified in CES. Uh, we've verified that empirically uh, at, in Google at the Kaha project where CES uh, was born in the ES5 era. And more recently, we verified it again with modern CES at Salesforce, at MetaMask, at Agoric, et cetera. However, um, old code obviously is not aware of CES. So it cannot use the abstractions of CES, it doesn't use the abstractions of CES to express security policy. The consequence of it running compatibly in CES is only that security policy can be imposed on it. Um, instead, a new code, which is aware that it's running under CES, can use the new abstractions, the compartment API I'm about to present, um, in order to impose security policy on other code, including this old code that is CES oblivious. The typical embedded configuration uh, uh, omits significant portions of JavaScript for other reasons, uh, specifically the reason that uh, an embedded device, it's um, uh, the main engineering pressure on it is to minimize RAM footprint. Um, minimizing ROM is also important, but minimizing RAM is much more important. Um, and that all of the code that runs on a typical embedded device uh, is determined at the time that the device ships. Uh, is, there's no need for dynamic evaluation of strings, so you don't have to have the, the embedded device support a full runtime interpreter. Uh, and that all of the modules, the embedded device, has really has no need for evaluating scripts at all. So all code is in modules, but furthermore, in an embedded device, typically all of the modules exist upfront at build time where the uh, manufacturer wants to pre-compile all those modules uh, and then uh, into, static, uh, into static representation uh, of, what's, of the linkable modules. And then only at run, at run time, the security policy is expressed only by controlling the instantiation, uh, linking and initialization of these modules to each other, how they're wired together and how they're wired to various sources of authority. And embedded also really has no need for multiple realms. Uh, uh, again, largely because of the um, memory footprint issue, uh, and also because having bought into uh, frozen primordials, uh, the compartment is a tremendously lightweight isolation mechanism uh, that is suitable for the needs of embedded. Uh, so the result is that the pure primordials being all transitively frozen can be placed in ROM. The static pre-compiled modules ready to be linked to, together, the static information can also all be placed in ROM. Uh, and then uh, the, the, uh, the amount of bookkeeping you then need in RAM to do flexible multi-compartment execution uh, is really surprisingly small. And I'll, I'll, I'll leave the quoting of concrete numbers to Modable, but they've been quoting rather amazing numbers on how little RAM they need to do this and to do this with uh, interesting policies and enforced by one piece of code on another. Uh, for those who were at the uh, CES meetup, um, uh, Peter was showing this uh, uh, making use of this enforcement mechanism uh, in a light bulb with a really, really tiny CPU chip. Some of these restrictions uh, have elements in common with uh, other, other subsetting mechanisms, other enforced subsetting mechanisms uh, that we're used to from the browser environment. Uh, for example, a CSP uh, for, um, for different but related security reasons 
uh, often will uh, turn, people will often use CSP to turn off the uh, script evaluators. And people often build web applications using packers where the packer will take all of the modules that will be part of the application, package them all together uh, to be shipped together, and then uh, often not need to do further dynamic loading at runtime of things beyond what's in the packer. So these all sort of push in, this, in a lot of the same directions. CES, of course, still includes the larger picture, but I'm going to focus here on what is in the, the intersection of all these needs. To understand the frozen primordials, let's, uh, let's take a look at the actual primordial, JavaScript primordial heap and what its, uh, what its configuration is. Uh, the prim there's, um, I'm using primordials to talk about all of the objects that must exist before code starts running. Uh, there is, um, uh, some people use the term intrinsic to mean the same thing. There's, um, uh, uh, some people take the stance that's what intrinsic means in the spec. Other people, uh, uh, otherwise I'm going to avoid the controversy um, and um, but I will be using the term shared intrinsics uh, coming up for, um, for an important element of the primordials. Uh, so in this uh, heap of objects and pointing relationships, uh, this is just intended to, to be just sort of a representative of some of the relationships that we find in the primordial heap. Um, the bidirectional arrow is um, a, a, a prototype property in one direction, constructor property in the other direction, and the vertical arrows are inherits from. Some of these uh, objects are undeniables, meaning that they're reachable from syntax. Um, uh, as we saw yesterday with uh, Karidi's presentation on uh, making use of the square bracket example for reaching array.prototype, uh, which I also mentioned in my um, uh, uh, preserve uh, host virtualizability talk. Uh, the things that can reach by, be reached by syntax, an initialization script cannot hide. So we need to assume that those are necessarily uh, accessible. And there's uh, the global object that points into that heap and points at itself with the, pro with the global this property. Um, and there's a special relationship here between the evaluators, the function constructor and the eval function and the global object, which is the eval function and the function constructor evaluate code in the scope of the global object. However, none of the other than the evaluators, um, including the other function constructors not shown, uh, none of uh, other than the evaluators, nothing else among the primordials points at the global object. There's no other way to get at the global object or do anything that's sensitive to the global object, starting from the non-evaluator primordials. Of course, the global object, as mentioned in the preserved virtualizability talk, uh, <coughs> is also the place that hosts are supposed to put uh, host objects that give code, JavaScript code, the ability to talk to the outside world, like on the browser, the document object. And some of these, uh, some of this initial heap is, uh, is powerful, is dangerous, is able to cause side effects or sense side effects to the outside world. The document enables code to talk to the user. Uh, the date object enables code to find out what the current time is, which is uh, concept, you know, should be thought of as a form of, of uh, IO input. And because uh, uh, these things are reachable from the global object, the global object itself is dangerous. And because the eval function and the function constructor evaluate code in the scope of the global object, uh, they're dangerous. So the first step towards um, uh, 
the what is what a cess environment is like is that we pull off all of the dangerous things into a start compartment and we leave behind the frozen shared intrinsics uh, the um, uh, function prototypes constructor property still points at something um, uh, that's a type of function but it's actually uh, just a, a, a function that always throws. Um, so that's why the function instructor is crossed off. Uh, the date constructor is still has almost all the normal functionality of the date constructor in the sense of creating date objects that represent um, the abstraction of representing a point in time um, uh, and all of the methods that operate on date objects, but it, it omits the ability to sense the current time. The global object on the start compartment um, for all the non-evaluator primordials uh, continues to point at them as part of the frozen intrinsic heap. The host objects are not part of the frozen intrinsic heap. They're in a separate category of, of powerful things purposely provided by the host. Uh, the um, function constructor, uh, its dot prototype property still points at the same function dot prototype. So that's shared. Um, uh, but uh, it's not pointed back to. So the result is that the start compartment seems much like the normal global object, uh, but it's only pointing into the shared intrinsic sets. There's no pointers back. And the result is that the start compartment can easily create through with the compartment API a new compartment which is completely isolated, is completely safe, is completely controlled by the, um, by the means by which it was created, by the parameters provided to the compartment constructor when it was asked to create a new compartment. So, uh, Mark, this, yeah. yeah for, for the data constructor, you said you omit sensing the current time. What about the time zone? Um, is this full of uh, conversions between UTC and, lo and local times? I think we. I, I, I think it's fair to say that the group as a whole has not uh, uh, arrived at definitive decisions on what the default state is. Um, but uh, the. Uh, but certainly the safe state, which 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 if not default, will be a configuration option. Uh, will be um, uh, to just uh, omit, well, to, to basically to have a fixed time zone, um, uh, such as uh, Greenwich Mean Time, uh, and to say that, that any other setting of time zone has to be done by other means. Okay. But uh, altogether, uh, you know, the honest answer on that one is TBD. We've, we've realized the time zone is, time zone and locale and, and such things are uh, annoyances that we need to come back to, but at least they're not high-speed channels. When one compartment creates another, it can also provide the new compartment with virtual host objects. So for example, uh, uh, if we're on a browser where the start compartment has the document object, then it can create another compartment that has a process object in order to uh, arrange an emulation of the node environment so that so that you can try to emulate the node host while on a doc, uh, uh, a browser host or vice versa. Uh, but the process object in this case is just an, uh, an object written in JavaScript uh, created by the controlling compartment. And in doing all this, of course, we're introducing this new compartment abstraction itself. So it has to go somewhere. And for reasons that we'll be explaining, uh, the compartment constructor itself, like the function constructor, has to be per compartment. The function constructor has to be per compartment because each compartment has its own evaluators that evaluate in its own global object. Um, and the compartment constructor. Uh, sorry, the compartment has to have its own compartment constructor because of a mapping relationship 
uh, in the import namespace among compartments, which we'll get, get back to at the end of the talk. But it's the overall wiring is much like the function constructor. Uh, all compartment constructors share the same uh, compartment prototype. And all compartment instances, like the green box and the star compartment are both the compartment instances, they all inherit from the same compartment prototype. This is the compartment API that we're proposing, and it addresses three different concerns. The elements having to do with setting up the new global object, uh, there's an endowments object, uh, which is an object whose own properties are copied onto the new global. Um, so the process object to emulate the node host uh, while on a browser host would, would typically be provided as an endowment. Um, there is a getter for getting the global. And um, as uh, Jordan pointed out in an issue on the Realm Shim, I think last night, uh, perhaps this uh, getter should be relabeled global this. Um, but in any case, it's a getter for obtaining the global of the new compartment. Every compartment, when you create it, you're creating a new global. Uh, and evaluate that. Uh, is essentially um, uh, an alias for the eval function for that compartment uh, in that it's doing a strict indirect eval, um, uh, evaluating the code as global code. Um, however, um, uh, for both the compartment constructor and the evaluate operation, we also add an optional options bag and the important one is on the compartment constructor, which is where we provide the host hooks, I'm sorry, the host hooks for emulating uh, host behavior with regard to the code running in that compartment. And then finally, there's the elements of the compartment constructor setting up the import namespace for the modules that are instantiated in that compartment or even for the scripts that are evaluated in that compartment, uh, setting up the import namespace seen by the dynamic import expression. Um, so uh, essentially what's going on here is that there's three namespaces that, that if you want to call it that, that code is sensitive to um, uh, that in, in the nature of this execution, there is the global scope in which its free variables are uh, dereference. Uh, there is the module import namespace used for uh, resolving its imports. Uh, and there's the host hooks, which isn't really a namespace, um, but is a uh, another means by which uh, um, how code executes is determined by the environment in which it executes. So we want all of those things to be providable on a per compartment basis. So the interesting one is uh, the issue of handling the import map. So in order to explain the module linkage and import semantics associated with compartments, uh, I, we first, I need to explain it in terms of the semantics of modules. And unfortunately, the spec language for explaining modules is uh, rather confusing. Uh, the, there's three abstractions in the spec module record, which is sort of an abstract superclass. Uh, the square brackets are the internal slots, which are the states associated with each of these abstractions. The cyclic module record is essentially a subclass that extends module record and inherits all that state, adds those new state variables, source text module record, uh, is the vast majority of modules uh, that we're familiar with, and it in turn inherits from cyclic module record, and therefore it has all of the state together. The state variables here, I've colored them to indicate the separate concerns that they're addressing. Uh, the blue state variables are, are, are static information. There's information that is derivable 
just from the source text in isolation by static analysis with no sensitivity to the environment it's going to run in and with no intramodule analysis. Um, so a, a pre-compile, for example, with embedded would preserve all of the semantics associated with the blue slots as part of the ROM state. Uh, the green is state associated with a module instance. Um, and the red is state associated with the activity of instantiating and initializing a module. And there's one very confusing term on this uh, slide, which um, uh, it's, it's now confusing because it's called the realm record. And as we've now divided up the concepts, it's not per realm at all. It's not about realms, it's really about compartments. So to avoid conf confusion, I'm going to temporarily relabel it R record before again relabeling it later. Um, and these elements have the following types. Um, and altogether, this, pics this picture, because of the way it mixes concerns into a common set of abstractions, is messy. Uh, it's messy in a way that impedes explanation. So I'm going to ask us to imagine that we refactor this. Um, uh, whether we actually do this refactoring or not is yet to be determined. Um, uh, but uh, what we want to specify with compartments should be equivalent to what I'll be explaining in terms of this refactoring. So the first thing is to divide um, uh, the state into three, three separate abstractions three, um, that do not inherit from each other, but rather include each other, uh, and that separate the concerns. So what I'm calling the static module record contains just the static information. The module instance contains a pointer to a static module record. And in addition, the uh, state that is per instance, the relationship between the module instance and the module static record is just like the relationship we're used to between a, um, between a lambda expression and a closure. Uh, and, and this gives us the flexibility that we expect by that analogy, which is the same static module record can be instantiated multiple times because you get multiple module instances sharing the same static module record. And then the module initialization uh, is only needed while a module graph is being instantiated, once it's done and it's fully initialized, all that information can be thrown away. So we make that a separate object that points into the module instance that instantiates so that, once we're, so that when we're reasoning about an instantiated graph, we can drop all of that state from what we need to be concerned with in our reasoning. And the module instance that appears here uh, preserves the parallelism with what is currently in the spec called the script record, which I'm renaming here for parallelism, the script instance. Uh, it has the same kind of duality. And all of the remaining interesting action in terms of the state that affects execution is in this R record thing. So, so far, all the steps are just pure refactoring. No semantic changes, no, no observable changes, no extra state. It's exactly the same state variables. They're just relocated. Um, but having done, and this could all be done as a separate PR refactoring that, has, that, that does not, that um, I would say does need to go through consensus process, but not through the staging process. However, given this, we now set the stage for our next step. Um, which is that the R record rather than um, goes from being an internal spec fiction that's, that's simply a internal data type for explaining semantics. We now make it a first class exposed exotic object. The compartment instance becomes an exotic object with those same internal slots. Uh, the intrinsic slot, I'm just renaming it here for expository purposes. Uh, that's where the realm context, that, that's where the realm concept got moved to. 
uh, that is the shared intrinsics um, uh, that is per realm. It's the only part of this picture that is the per realm state. Um, and we add to the compartment the, uh, the uh, module map, which is all about mapping from specifier strings to modules, either mo static module records or module instances. Why it mapping to one or the other, I'll be coming back to. Uh, and the hooks, so the code executing in that, uh, where the execution needs some behavior provided by a host hook, will obtain that behavior by the host hooks that are recorded in that slot. So having arrived at our uh, compartment exotic object, we can now go back and explain our API in terms of how the exposed operations relate to that hidden internal state. The uh, elements bold faced on the right are relate to the, well, the, the elements bold faced on the right are affect the elements bold faced on the left. The endowments are copied onto the global object after copying the uh, normal global variables pointing to the shared intrinsics, and then after copying uh, the evaluators, eval function, function constructor, uh, and compartment constructor. Um, uh, and then of course, these strings are evaluated in the context of the global environment, providing the lexical environment that ali aliases the properties of the global object uh, onto global variables. The options, um, uh, especially the constructor option, well, the constructor option specifically, um, uh, provide both the hooks that get recorded in the hook slot, and uh, the spec provides for this other uh, um, host defined field in a uh, R record, uh, which we're preserving here uh, pending further investigation to actually understand. Uh, what hosts use that for and whether we can unbundle some of that. Uh, but right now we're just saying that the options can end up uh, providing uh, information that goes into that host defined slot to affect those elements of host behavior that depend on that. And then finally, we come back to uh, the module mapping. Uh, and this is really where most of the work um, um, by the, uh, that most of the work on CES design over the last six months to a year have really been on trying to figure out uh, how to think about modules uh, in a way that enables uh, good control over um, import namespace, wiring things together, being able to do least authority linkage, uh, and accommodates uh, use cases that include um, uh, TC53 and embedded devices. So to explain this, I'm going to go back to a hardware analogy, which is the way memory mapping units in hardware translate our virtual addresses to physical addresses. Uh, earlier in my preserve virtualizability talk, I talked about um, uh, the architecture uh, enabling the operating system to control things via traps, uh, but it's not just traps. Uh, the memory mapping unit uh, also maps memory addresses to memory addresses, not through traps as long as the memory being mapped to is already uh, a, a, a page of physical memory. So there's a uh, so there's virtual addresses that go through the MMU to turn into physical addresses. And then for some of those physical addresses, there's already a physical memory page. So it proceeds with no trapping just by direct translation. Uh, and then uh, for some of those, there is no mapped in physical page. So in that case, it does cause a trap, which causes a page to be loaded. So, 
So the analogy that I want to make here is that when one module controls another, the controlling module determines the import namespace of the controlled module by providing a mapping from what the controlled module sees to the namespace of the controlling module. And in a embedded situation where all the modules are preloaded, uh, then the mapping uh, can all just be an immediate synchronous mapping with no need for asynchronous delays because there's nothing, there's, there's no static module information that's not already loaded. Uh, and that in the larger uh, web context, uh, we obviously we still need to, to, to deal with what does it mean to name a uh, import that's not yet locally known, so we need to accommodate both synchronous and asynchronous uh, loading. And we want to do this mapping uh, an arbitrary number of levels deep. This is where the, the um, ancestry relationship among compartments comes in, which is what led us to have uh, the compartment constructor itself be created per compartment, uh, so that when the, the parent creates a child, the module mapping it provides maps the child's names to the parent's names. When the child creates a grandchild, it, it provides a mapping, mapping the grandchild's names to the child's names. Uh, in both cases, we enforce the uh, intuitive restriction that you can only provide something you have. So the, the, the child cannot grant to the grandchild something the child has no access to, but it can change the name however it likes. Um, And that multi-level mapping seems to indicate that dereferencing a name through the mapping has a linear cost of, of repeated translations uh, through the levels, uh, but that's uh, not the case at all. Um, and I'm, I'm speaking about the actual implementation. Uh, it's already not the case in the implementation. Uh, and the reason is that the mapping is, uh, is fixed up front and uh, turns into, in, at the, in the internal state, a mapping from specifiers to either static module records or module instances. So the analogy I'm making with the, with the MMU only accounts for the static module record portion of that. And likewise, on the module map parameter here, it only accounts for the name to name portion of that, mapping from specifier string to specifier string. Uh, in the case where um, you're just providing name name mapping in the API, turning into a name to static module record mapping in the internal state, uh, an import of that module in a new compartment creates a new instantiation of that static module record, creates a new instance of it in the new compartment. Uh, so that case uh, uh, creates strong isolation. You're sharing code, you're mapping what, what code is being referred to, but uh, each module by using th that namespace um, is getting new instances of the modules. That does not enable least authority linkage. Uh, it does not enable uh, the instantiation of uh, a module in one compartment giving that module in that compartment what it needs because of, of the nature of that module. And then pro using that module instance in compartment A to satisfy an import of that module in compartment B. Uh, where compartment B has different authorities. And this is really the big payoff for least authority linkage uh, is being able to uh, take a system and give different modules only the authority they need for their proper job so that we're no longer uh, completely vulnerable to every third party library we link in. 
uh, so that we can be resistant to things like the event stream incident attack, where an innocent NPM upgrade at attacked the application it was linked into by making use of authorities that it should not have, that, that its legitimate job did not justify its access to. And this is um, much of what um, Audible is doing, it's much of what MetaMask is doing, it's much of what uh, Bradley has been engineering for and what Node will be doing. Um, uh, and um, it relates strongly to what Salesforce is doing. Um, so the way in which that works starts with the observation that static module records are not a reified concept. Module instances are not a reified concept. We're not proposing to reify either of those in the compartment API. Uh, however, there is exactly a one-to-one -one for, for modules that have been instantiated. There is a one-to-one -one correspondence between module namespaces and the modules that they're instances of. So in the API, uh, by providing the module namespace object uh, in the module mapping, you're saying in the compartment being made, when it imports this name, what it should get is the, the uh, a connection to the, the module instance providing this module namespace object. Um, and then that becomes the module instance in the internal state at the bottom. And uh, now I will take questions and uh, can, oh, the host is me on the other computer. I will now stop recording.